Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. This series was made possible in part through the generosity of Amgen, and we thank them for their support. My name is Mike Spigler, and I'm the Vice President of Patient Services and Kidney Disease Education here at the American Kidney Fund. Before we begin, I'd like to direct your attention to the control panel you should see on your screens. All particip participants are on mute, so we won't hear you, but we welcome your questions. If you do have a question, please type it into the section of your control panel titled Questions. We'll see your questions and we'll do our best to answer them, either by replying to you in the questions box or out loud during the last several minutes of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available for viewing on our website at kidneyfund.org slash webinars within the next one to two weeks. For those of you in attendance who are health professionals, we are glad that you've joined us today and hope you'll recommend this webinar to the patients you work with. However, as a friendly reminder, this webinar is not accredited for continuing education credits and you will not receive a certificate upon completion. If you believe that your accrediting body may offer you credits for attending this webinar, we'll be happy to send you a certificate of attendance after today's session. Simply email us at education at kidneyfund.org. Today's webinar will be unique in that we have three speakers all here to discuss one very important topic, living kidney donation. I'd like to share a bit about each of our guests today who include Heather and Steve Winfrey, who are both patient advocates, as well as Dr. Macy Henderson of Johns Hopkins University. Steve and Heather Winfrey have been married for five years and Steve has been battling kidney disease for 14 years and began dialysis just over a year ago. Just recently, Heather found out she was a match to donate one of her kidneys to her husband, Steve. Heather recorded a video of Steve as she revealed the news to him that she was a match. She created a custom baseball card as part of the surprise, and the video went viral overnight. Steve and Heather have been featured on ESPN, CNN, Fox News, Inside Edition, ABC News, NBC Sports, Sports Illustrated, and People Magazine for their video. They have recently been invited on the Harry Connick Jr. Show, as well as Kelly Pickler's talk show. Steve and Heather are advocates for the American Kidney Fund and take this role very seriously. They're glad to use the platform they have been given to bring awareness to kidney disease and live kidney donors. They will learn the date of their transplant surgery soon and are expecting the operation to take place within weeks. Our third speaker, Dr. Macy Henderson, is an assistant professor of surgery and nursing at Johns Hopkins University. Her background in law, ethics, health policy, and management support her research into the health outcomes of living donor, kidney donors and transplant patients. She draws on the areas of health information technology, clinical informatics, media, communications, and implementation science to drive innovation and new technology to improve the lives of transplant patients and live donors. As a national expert in organ transplant policy and through her dedication and service to the National Organ Transplant Network, Dr. Henderson actively developed policy and guidance related to the donation and transplantation of organs from living donors to recipients in the U.S. and serves on the board of directors at the Organ Procurement and Transplant Network, the United Network for Organ Sharing. Dr. Henderson is currently funded by the National Institute of Diabetes and Digestive and Kidney Diseases to study living donor outcomes and as a recipient of the Rothman Early Career Development Award for surgical research to develop technolo technological innovations in live kidney donor post-donation care management. She recently received a faculty development award from the Johns Hopkins Center for AIDS Research to lead a team to develop and implement informed consent process for HIV positive living donor candidates under HOPE Act research protocols. She's also the principal of Kidney Space, a Facebook integrated health app to help patients and families learn about kidney disease and transplantation. We're honored to have all three speakers with us today, and we're excited to hear from more from each of them. We're going to get started by asking Steve and Heather a few questions about their personal experiences, and then we'll transition to Dr. Henderson, who will give us a thorough overview of the living kidney donation process. So we will get started. So Steve and Heather, our first question is for you. Uh, before we air a portion of your viral video, would you start by just giving us a brief overview of your journey with kidney disease and what led you to become a, a patient advocate? Yeah, uh, this is Steve Winfrey, and I, I do want to thank everybody who um, had taken time today to join this webinar. That really means a lot to us, and thank you to the American Kidney Fund for having us. Um, wow, uh, my journey with kidney disease, it started, like uh, Mike had mentioned, 14 years ago when I was 18 years old and I had just signed to play college basketball. So 
I had worked my entire childhood to get to that point, and we were about two or three weeks from our first game, and we had a preseason physical. And during that physical, I came up to the very last test, which is usually the easiest test to pass, and that's the blood pressure cuff. And I uh, got to the blood pressure cuff, and my blood pressure read like 180 over 120-something. And obviously, that's extremely high and extremely dangerous for anybody. But for somebody um, who's as young as I was and, you know, was in decent shape, it definitely was a major red flag. And from there, they did some blood work. And next thing I know, I'm being called into a nephrologist's office. And I have absolutely no idea what a nephrologist was at that point. All I knew was I was having to see a doctor because something was wrong with my blood work. And he comes in and says, I'm sorry, Steve, but you can't play basketball because you have kidney failure. Um, I had, at that point, I had less than 50% of my function. And he just said, I'm sorry, from this moment forward, we can't let you participate because of your blood pressure. And from that day forward, it, it changed my life forever. And as time has gone on over these 14 years, um, Kidney failure, kidney disease itself is fairly asymptomatic until you get into the later stages. And as years started going on, the biggest problem that I faced was gout. I do get severe gout in all of my joints because of uh, my kidney disease. And that's really, to be quite honest with everybody, been the biggest issue in fighting this disease is the, the pain that I'm in every day. Um, and to answer the question, what led me to becoming an advocate? That's actually something that happened over the last couple of years because, you know, I was so young going through this disease in the beginning that I didn't fully understand it. I didn't fully appreciate it. And thus, sometimes I didn't handle it the way I should. And as time went on, I began letting the disease kind of overtake me. Um, it controlled my happiness. It controlled just about every aspect of my life. And I finally got to a point where I said, you know what, no more. This is just who I am. Um, this is a part of my life. Now, how can I take one of the worst things happening to me and use it for good? And it was when that light bulb went off that I decided to be a patient advocate and I reached out to the American Kidney Fund. And this, this is Heather and I just um, wanted to thank you all for having us today. Um, I became a patient advocate because obviously my husband has kidney disease and is on dialysis and um, is working towards the transplant, but kidney disease isn't just a disease that affects the patient. It's a, it's a family disease. It affects the family. It affects, you know, our lifestyle, um, especially with Steve being on dialysis, it affects our finances. And so it was important for me to be 100% involved in, you know, making the best of our situation so that we could, um, have the best future possible. Thank you both very much for sharing your story. Um, well, now I wanted to show the video, Stephen Heather's video that they captured, um, which has gone viral. Um, and many of you may have already seen this because it really was everywhere, but we want to show it again uh, here for you right now. Okay. What does it say on the back? Flutter hand. Who's on it? Is it an up and coming? Who is it? Yeah, it looks like it. Who is it? Hey, look at me. Hi, oh, Steve. What's it say on the back? Read it. That's so cool. <laughs> <coughs> you. All right. Steve's had a lot on his plate. With his health issues, he's been striking out a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Baseball pen. He was not sure how he was going to wind up. His wife Heather thinks he is a great catch, so she decided to go to bat for him. Now Steve will be a rookie recipient at Vanderbilt training. <laughs> <laughs> Steve, what's going on out today? Oh, I'm at work. I'm a mess. <laughs> I need to be doing it to me. What are you doing? Monday before I even knew 
um, and it takes three to five days. So I called him, or I messaged Tops today because I hadn't got it yet. And I heard the news, and she sent me the, the proof so I could tell you immediately because I, I couldn't wait, and I really wanted to tell you in a special way. <laughs> but you have your very own top special edition card. <laughs> for that. Saving my life. <laughs> yeah, for that. <laughs> I, I got. So I think it's no surprise your video gained so much attention and it went viral. And uh, it's such a special moment that you were able to capture and, and share with the world. Steve, I, I'm wondering what were you feeling in that moment that Heather revealed the news that she was a match? Wow. Uh, huh. You know, watching the video again, I, ha I hadn't seen it in a little bit. Um, it kind of brings back some of those emotions that I did feel. And some of those emotions I had were, at first I had to, I didn't fully understand what was going on because, you know, the whole day was kind of weird with her telling me to go get my hair cut and, like, saying all these nice things that she would normally do, and I messed with her about that. And so when she said she wanted to film me, opening these cards, I was just like, you know what, I'm going to roll with it and uh, kind of see what, what happens. And when I saw the card, I kind of knew, um, but when I flipped it over and I got to that sentence that you guys saw um, where I was going to be a rookie recipient, I, I knew exactly what that meant. And I tell people it's almost like 14 years of pain, sadness, anger, confusion, um, a little bit of depression just kind of all came out at once. And that's what you saw with me crying because it was disbelief. Um, it literally is one of the top moments of my life. I will never forget how I felt. And when I found out that my wife was saving my life, I mean, I, it, it's hard to even put into words what that means. Um, and to be quite honest, after I broke down and started crying, I forgot she was filming. Um, I didn't even realize she was filming because I was just kind of lost in my own head there and thinking, are you serious? And then I think in the video you hear me say, so you want to save my life? That was like when it all came to a point and I realized what she was doing. And and I'll be honest, going through what I call my miracle moment um, has made me even more serious about being an advocate and doing things like this because being a dialysis patient, there's so many good people out there who deserve their own miracle moment as well. Thank you, Steve. It's a really great way of putting that. Uh, so Heather, how did you make the decision to donate one of your kidneys to Steve? Yeah, um, Steve is my best friend and the love of my life. And we started dating about a little over seven years ago. And um, as soon as I found out that he had kidney disease, I actually started um, and he told me that eventually he'd either need to be on dialysis or have a, a transplant. And so, um, you know, unbeknownst to him, seven years ago, I actually started doing research on living donation and had reached out to other people who um, had donated as well. And um, I had made the decision back then when we were dating that as soon as he needed a kidney, that I would be the first one to to get tested and see if I was a match. And about a year ago, we went to a health fair and they had a, you know, find out what your blood type is test. And I was really curious because all this time in my mind, you know, he was getting closer and closer to needing a transplant. I was like, well, let's, let's get, you know, our blood typing tested because that's the first thing they look at um, other than, you know, pre-screening to make sure you're, you know, you don't have any, you know, high blood pressure you know, diabetes, anything that would automatically disqualify you. And so um, we found out then that we were both so positive blood and that kind of gave me a little bit of hope this whole time waiting, you know, at least the first initial thing um, we had checked off. And so, um, yeah, seven years ago, I decided I was going to do it. And it's just cool how everything's fallen into place um, along our journey um, to get us to to where we're at right now. So speaking of that journey, what's the process been like so far with all the testing and what stage of the process are you in right now? 
Yeah, um, the the testing process has gone really smoothly, and I'm surprised with how quickly it, it's gone. I think we started the process back in May, uh, May or June, and um, basically, um, first I had to fill out a questionnaire. They asked me about, you know, my health background, what, you know, type of medications I'm on or anything like that, and just, um, just a pre-screening to see if they would even, you know, consider me as a donor and then I, I passed that so they gave me a call and um, talked to me about you know the process and they scheduled me to um, to do some blood work just initial blood work to see if we were a match and then once I found out or before I even found out that I was a match I I knew that this was a big deal and I had a good feeling about it I had a hope in my heart that it would work out and so before I knew I was a match, I started planning how I was going to sell Steve because I wanted to, to make it special because it was a very important moment in our life. So, um, like you saw in the video, I I planned, you know, giving him that card. I I had it made before I even knew I was a match to let him know I was a match. And so, um, once I found out I was a match, I had to get scheduled to go to um, Vanderbilt Transplant Center, where um, hopefully we'll be having the surgery. I went last week for two days of testing, and I'm still waiting on um, a few of the results to come back. And we have um, a transplant committee meeting on the 28th of this month to um, all the nurses, doctors, social workers, nutritionists, everyone that I met with um, is going to meet and talk about my case and make sure that they all agree that I'm in good enough health and um, mental state to donate. And then um, if everything goes through well, then, uh, then they'll start, um, they'll, they'll schedule the um, surgery from there. But it's been such a, an easy process. I've been really surprised with how efficient everything's gone and how um, really like they take care of everything. I just, I just basically showed up and, you know, it's as difficult as, you know, a, a needle prick for blood work. It really wasn't very difficult. They did, you know, an EKG and um, a CT scan and um, blood work, you know, just basically a very thorough um, health screen to make sure you're in good, good enough health to donate. They want to make sure that you're not putting your life at risk to save somebody else's so they the vetting process it's it's very thorough but it's not it's not a difficult process to go through thank you through this process is there anything that you've learned that you would like to tell others who are considering being an organ donor um i would say that um you know at any point in the process um it's very open communication so if you decide any any point in the process that you don't feel comfortable. Um, they take your privacy very seriously and obviously it's a very personal decision. Um, so start that process and get educated. Go go through the testing and at any point, you know, if they don't think you're a good candidate for it um, and that there is risk, you know, a high level of risk for you, you know, they won't let you donate. So um, get tested. See if see if you are a good candidate. And um, if you're not, you know that you you've done what you could to save a life. And um, even if you're not able to be a donor, you can still be an advocate. Um, but I would encourage everybody to definitely get tested because honestly, there's no better gift I think to even the donor than to be able to give the gift of life. It, it's a very life changing experience. To, to be able to know that you can save somebody's life. We only need one kidney, kidney. and so, you know, most of us are born with two, um, so it just makes sense to, to share your spare and um, help somebody um, who, needs, who needs one. Thanks, Heather. So, Steve, what does it mean to you to be receiving a kidney from your wife? It means everything. It, you know, I'll tell you that it doesn't really surprise me that it's playing out this way because 
there's always been just something so special about her um, from the day I met her. She's truly one of the most genuine, caring, selfless people I have ever met. And so for her to be doing this doesn't surprise me, but at the same time, it's the most amazing thing in the world to me. Um, I mean, as a wife, husband and wife, we are best friends and we are there for each other. And I would, I would do anything for her and I know she would do anything for me, but then that, you know, you say those things, but for her to literally be giving me an organ to, to keep going. I mean, that is the ultimate sign of love in my opinion. And I just wish I could repay her. I wish there was a way I could repay her. Um, I feel like I'll never be able to thank her enough. And, you know, it's kind of funny, you know, people have, a lot of people have said, well, if she's giving you a kidney, you do realize you'll never win another argument. You'll never be able to do this, this and that. And, uh, we joke about things like that, but it's, it's, she genuinely is doing it out of the goodness of her heart. And it gives me hope. Um, because for a long time there, I'll tell you, um, as a dialysis patient, sometimes the hardest part about dealing with dialysis is dealing with the mental aspect because um, you start losing hope or you start feeling like you want to give up because it's just too much. You start thinking, you know, where's my miracle? Where's my opportunity? And I want to tell people, hey, sometimes it could be the person sitting right next to you and you just don't know it. Just keep the faith and keep going. Thanks, Steve. Do you have any advice that you could give someone who's just starting out on dialysis and is waiting on a transplant? Yeah, the biggest thing I would say, and this is something that I, I've definitely learned over the past couple of months, is as hard as it can be sometimes, um, emotionally, physically, starting dialysis, going through dialysis, and waiting on that transplant, try, try not to give up hope. You know, keep your faith alive. Try to stay positive. Um, I, I'm very big into being realistic. And what I mean by that is I think it's healthy to to stay positive, but at the same time, it is okay to realize that your situation is is not good. You know what I mean? Like, it's not ideal. Um, it's not fun going to dialysis. It's not, it's not fun waiting on a transplant. But at the same time, you know, keep your faith alive. Keep, keep positive. And know that there are people out there that you don't even know that love you and they would be willing to, to donate to you. Um, the response that I have gotten personally from that viral video, and this is coming from all over the world, is the number of people who have sent me a message and said, how can I sign up to be a donor? <clears throat> how can I sign up to, to possibly donate to you if something happens with your wife? And so I want to tell people, you know, there are good people out there, good-hearted people, um, selfless folks. So just stay strong. Keep, you know, keep doing what you have to do. Make sure you listen to your doctors. Um, do what you need to do because, you know, I learned that as well. One thing I learned going through this process of trying to be on the transplant list is while there is a shortage of donors, there is an issue of some kidney disease patients who are on dialysis who aren't necessarily doing what they need to do to be on the list. Um, taking care of yourself, taking your medicine, not missing dialysis appointments. So um, just make sure you listen to your doctors. Um, be open. Don't ever hold anything in. If you're if you're feeling a certain way, if you're sad or you're feeling down about dialysis, reach out to a friend. Reach out to the American Kidney Fund. Heck, you can reach out to me. Um, we'll be glad to talk to you. Um, I never met a stranger. We're all on the same team here and uh, trying to just survive this disease. And that kind of makes us brothers and sisters and CKD. So um, please don't hesitate to reach out to one of us. Thank you, Steve. What are your plans uh, for life post-transplant? Well, I know um, right after the transplant, it's going to be a little hectic. Um, currently, Heather and I are getting a lot of calls um, to do some media stuff. Um, I think you had mentioned... Harry Connick Jr. show, um, Kelly Pickler. Um, we've been hit up quite a bit from just about every news station in the area to do the media stuff and do advocating um, in that regard. So advocating for us will be a big, a big thing. Um, personally, I'm hoping to feel good, you know. I'm hoping to, 
for the first time in my adult life, I'm hoping to be able to get up out of bed and and feel good and be able to hang out with our foster kids and run around with them and just be happy. Um, I think my ultimate plan after transplant is to be happy, to enjoy this this gift that is a blessing that I don't take for granted and uh, see what a Steve without CKD, you know, feels like and uh, make the most of it. Like I said, the biggest thing that you'll see from uh, me and, and Heather is our level of advocacy is going to uh, increase dramatically. Thank you so much, Steve and Heather, for sharing your story with us. And for everyone that, that's watching, Steve and Heather will actually be here until the end of the webinar and can take your questions uh, once our next speaker, Dr. Henderson, has finished her presentation. But now I would like to turn it over to our next speaker, Dr. Macy Henderson, uh, for her piece. Hi, thank you guys so much for having me here today. Um, appreciate the invitation from the American Kidney Fund, and it was great to hear you, Steve and Heather, talk about your story, and I'm really excited for the future for you guys. So I'm going to talk with you a little bit today about understanding the risks, benefits, and the process of living kidney donation. So living kidney donation is one of two types of kidney transplant that you can have, right? You can receive a kidney transplant from a deceased donor, and you can see here on my chart from the United Network for Organ Sharing, which is our national transplant system, um, that there's only been about 29,000 living donor transplants in the United States. Um, in the recent years, right? So we do a lot more deceased donor transplants than we do living donor transplants. And on average, we're looking at about 5,600 people a year that have been donating kidneys. So there's three different types of living donor transplants. You have directed donation, non-directed donation, and paired donation. And I'll just explain each of these three types very briefly. So directed donation is the most common type of living donation, which is in the case of Steve and Heather. Heather is making a directed donation to her husband, Steve. So you basically are a donor who names your um, intended recipient, and these people can be biologically related or biologically unrelated, as Heather is biologically unrelated to Steve. Um, or they can be people that you don't even uh, are, are close within your family, but are part of your sort of extended network um, who do know about your need for a donation. Then we have, um, that's a lot less common, we have non-directed donation, but this um, type of donation is rapidly sort of increasing in popularity and we're getting a lot more of these types of donors. Um, non-directed donors don't name the specific person who received their organ for transplant, and the match is arranged based on medical compatibility with the patient in need, and the transplant center or um, an organization uh, focuses um, on these types of donations. So sometimes you meet your, do uh, your recipient and sometimes you don't, but this is usually about mutual agreement if you do. And then oftentimes these non-directed donors will go into a pool or a paired exchange program and set off a chain reaction of kidney donors if you are incompatible with your intended recipient um, and people can trade kidney. So I think maybe people have heard of kidney exchanges, kidney swaps or kidney chains. And that's when two people who are incompatible are able to swap. You can see here, um, this graphic is from the United Network for Organ Sharing, and it explains a four-way map, and then there's a one below it that explains how a non-directed donor, as I spoke about earlier, can set off a chain of donations. So what are the risks and benefits of kidney donations? So first and foremost, as Heather sort of mentioned, and she talked about this a couple of times, you're able sort of to back out of this process at any point in time. And that's one of the biggest things about informed consent is that a donor, someone who steps forward to be a donor must be able to say that they want to donate, that no one forced them into donating, and that no one would give you anything special of value, particularly monetary things of value for your donation. That is illegal and against the law. Um, and I also mentioned you, you, you also want to go into this knowing that you can change your mind at any point in time. It's one of our biggest important things. There are actually advantages for the living donor. Um, Heather mentioned that she wanted to do this to be um, help her family and, and dialysis and the, the CKD and the ESRD affect even their personal finances. And so other than the things I have here um, on the screen, there are benefits um, to living donation 
for people that are in relationships, interdependent relationships like Steve and Heather, but there are no medical benefits to the donor and that's important for everyone to understand. Um, there are other benefits that you can have, like you get an extensive medical workup um, that you may not have otherwise had where you could potentially learn of unknown or known medical problems. Some donors do experience a boost in self-esteem or an increased sense of well-being from donation. Um, and oftentimes, recipients and donors report that they have an improved relationship after the donation. So what are the advantages of kidney transplantation to the recipient, right? So kidney transplant gives a person on dialysis or someone with chronic kidney disease or end-stage renal disease a better quality of life. No more dialysis, more free time, your blood pressure becomes more stable, your electrolyte levels um, level out, and also people that are on dialysis oftentimes can't work. So we see higher rates of employment among adults who receive kidney transplants than those who end up staying on dialysis. There is an option for preemptive transplantation, so someone who knows that they're going to eventually need a kidney might be able to avoid dialysis altogether by having a living donor step forward in that instance prior to going on dialysis. Um, on average, kidneys from living donors last longer. Okay, so you can receive a deceased donor kidney on the transplant wait list, and that's a wonderful gift. But science shows that five years after receiving a kidney transplant, 86% of living donor uh, kidney transplant recipients have a working kidney um, versus 74% of deceased donor kidney transplants. That doesn't mean that deceased donor transplants aren't good. It just means that if you have a choice and if you have someone willing to be a living donor, it actually is statistically better uh, for your long-term functioning of that organ, okay? Also, as I mentioned, this preemptive transplant where you don't have to be on dialysis um, in order to receive a kidney transplant from a living donor um, if you need it. If you can plan these things out, um, it can be a benefit to your long-term health if you're a kidney patient. Um, as well, this is a planned surgery. As you heard from Heather and Steve, they still don't have their surgery date yet, but that's something that they will be able to plan with their other things in life to make sure that they have child care and to make sure they have all other things going on. It can be a lot better than getting a call in the middle of the night saying, hey, a kidney's available, can you be here in how many hours? Very few. So now I'm gonna to talk to you about what to expect as a living donor, right? So there's four sort of big areas. First is the screening and evaluation. Then after you make it through that, which is a very robust and comprehensive process that we hope that transplant centers make easy for you, as Heather mentioned that Vanderbilt has been. Um, and then after that, there's the actual surgery, and then you have recovery. I also want to add a fourth step, because this is the area that I focus on specifically, which is the long-term follow-up and care for living kidney donors afterwards, and I think it's important to talk about. So at the first stage of living donor screening and evaluation, you'll undergo tissue typing and lab screening. Um, so your tissue type basically determines if you're compatible with the other person um, after your blood typing. Some centers are doing these together at the same time. Some transplant centers will make you have the um, blood type first and then tissue typing, um, those are sort of changing right now in the way some transplant centers are doing evaluation and screening to enable more candidates to step forward for a particular candidate and to move people through the process more efficiently. So you need to check with your transplant center about how they are going to do that. Um, remember, if you come back and you wanna be a living donor but you don't have the same blood type or you don't have the same tissue type as your intended recipient, there are options for you. Um, we do have options so people can um, still donate. Like I mentioned earlier, you can go into a paired kidney exchange program. We also can do blood type incompatible transplants. Um, some centers can do these things. And there's also the ability to have sensitized and positive cross match transplants. So these are all things that you should talk about with your um, care team if you are an incompatible match, yet you still want to donate. So the lab testing that you'll receive in screening and evaluation, as Heather mentioned earlier, it's the blood test, urine test. You'll, if you're a woman, you'll have to have an, a gynecological exam and a pap smear. 
if you're over 50, you've got to have a colonoscopy. That's something that people oftentimes don't like to have, but those are traditional sort of preventive health services that you would need anyways, and so those are required in our screening and evaluation. We do test for some sort of cancers and um, test for your antibodies, and those are things that um, will happen early on in your donation screening and evaluation. If those labs are satisfactory, then you usually will meet with a transplant clinician to discuss the procedure of living donation itself. And then sort of the other risks that are associated with more advanced testing um, and screening. So you have to also agree, you have to consent for this process as well um, to get more, more tests. During the medical evaluation, you could have some things happen to you that we want everyone to know about as, as proper informed consent, right? So you could potentially be allergic to a test and have a bad reaction. You could just, they could discover that there is an infection that the hospital staff need to report based on local um, um, laws and um, public health laws. Um, it's happened before where people get tested to be a living donor and they discover a serious medical condition that could require more tests of them or it's something that they need to take care of on their own dollar. So you might have to pay for something if you discovered uh, something you may not know about that in advance. Um, and not genetic testing is not standard and routine at all transplant centers in the United States currently, but if you are in a place where it's doing genetic testing, that is also a potential um, uh, problem that you could learn about that happens during evaluation. So all of this additional testing includes basically a full day, at, at least at Johns Hopkins, it's a full day. I don't know how it is at every other transplant program, but it's usually an extensive period of time. So you're probably going to be there for at least a couple hours, if not a half a day. Um, those tests include all of your x-rays, EKGs, CT scans, where they, you know, you do some IV contrast dye and they look and see what your kidney actually looks like. And that's something that's very important to help a surgeon determine um, what kidney, if a kidney, they are going to be able to safely remove from you for your recipient. Um, usually on this big day, you also meet with a psychologist um, or a, a someone who's a social worker who's in charge of the living donor psychosocial evaluation portion of this. And this is something that everybody has to go through with the national mandate of psychosocial evaluation. Um, you'll also meet with somebody that's a donor advocate, which we technically call them an independent living donor advocate, but they usually are still in working at the transplant hospital or at the hospital um, affiliated with the transplant program, then you usually will meet your nurse coordinator who will help you through this process further on. There might be plenty of other people that you meet, but these are just a few of the key folks. Um, and you may also be told that further testing might be required. So this is not an, um, by any means exclusive or exhaustive list for every person. So. What are the couple things that could actually happen to you that's a medical risk if you do end up being a donor, right? We tell you that you can die, you can get disease from this, kidney disease in the future, or other types of diseases. You don't really, um, can't be certain. Um, but being very overweight, being older or having high blood pressure or other medical conditions could make you more likely to die or have a problem than if you weren't. Um, also, I can, I can say for a fact that living donation is very safe. And in a study that we looked at, all living donors who donated from 1994 to 2009, only 25 out of 80,347 donors died within 90 days of donation. So that's really only about like 0.03% or three in 10,000 people will die from donation a very safe surgical procedure. You can have scars, you can get a hernia from your incision site, there's infection risk, blood clots and pneumonia, nerve injury, pain, tiredness, and other symptoms that are very common when you have any surgery. This is not just specifically to living donation, but these are things that could happen to you if you become a donor. Oftentimes people have abdominal symptoms like bloating, nausea, or having bowel obstruction, those are often things that could potentially happen to you. 
Some things that could happen after donating that involve your mental state or your, psycho, your psychosocial things in life, some donors have problems with how they feel about their body or how their body looks like after donation. Um, some donors have had problems with depression or gotten stressed out or have some sort of fear about um, their future life after donating, but these things are very, very rare. We also know that feeling sad if the transplant recipient becomes ill or dies is something that donors have to deal with, and that is a, is a risk that they will talk with you about at the transplant program if you step forward to donate. Um, you, you might have to make some changes to your lifestyle because you donated an organ. Um, people ask this all the time, and I'll just go ahead and say it. We don't recommend major lifestyle changes, but what we do want to see is that you stay healthy after donation. You keep your weight normal. You do not get overweight. You keep your blood sugar and your glucose tolerance low, which means you you prevent diabetes and hypertension. If you do those three things, I think those are healthy lifestyle changes and choices for everyone, not just people that donate to me. We also talk about potential money problems after donating, and th this is something that's important for people to understand. Um, sometimes you might have trouble paying for travel or short-term housing or even childcare um, that may not be able to be covered or paid for while you're recovering from surgery. So these are things that you need to think about. Right now, um, we are working as a national transplant community to make living donation something that's financially neutral for people, but it's still a struggle. So sometimes people have to pay for costs that are associated with lifelong follow-up um, and making sure that you are able to take care of your, yourself afterwards. Some donors have reported losing a job or income or having a hard time finding a job in the future. Those have happened. Um, they are not very common, but they have happened. Um, sometimes people can have a hard time getting, keeping, or paying for health insurance. Now, this is a very tricky area, and things are changing as we speak nationally with our health insurance. So technically, under the Affordable Care Act, you're not supposed to be denied coverage for health insurance or considered to have a pre-existing condition for donation, but we're still seeing that our um, living donor advocates at Hopkins inform everyone that these things still could be a problem or a risk because we're kind of in an uncertain environment, right? Um, these things, it goes for health insurance, disability insurance, and life insurance. Um, and these future health problems that a donor might have one day will not be covered by the transplant recipient's insurance, although there are some insurance companies that are trying to step up to the plate and make this better, and I'm very hopeful that a lot of the work that we do moving forward will make that a better solution for all donors and recipients moving forward, but it is a risk that everyone should be aware of today. So on average, a couple of things you should really know is that donating a kidney means that you will permanently lose 25 to 35% of your kidney function after donating. Um, your risk of having kidney failure later in your life is really not any higher than it is for someone in the general population that is your same age, sex, or race. However, it is very important for potential donors to understand that you are more likely to have kidney failure than healthy people who are not. One of the risks of kidney donation is chronic kidney disease, which is what, why Steve ended up needing a transplant to begin with, because CKD, chronic kidney disease, goes all the way through several stages until it reaches end-stage renal disease. But chronic kidney disease often doesn't start until the middle of your life. It's people that are younger get it all the time, but it's commonly that starts after age 60. So if you're a very young donor in your early 20s and you get tested and you are a donor, right now uh, with the science that we have today, doctors cannot predict how likely you are to actually get chronic kidney disease or move to chronic kidney failure and stage renal disease in, later in your life. We're working very diligently very diligently to be able to produce better tools so that doctors and transplant centers can help identify these things for younger donors. But as of right now, that is still the truth. Um, also, if you do damage your other kidney, the one you didn't donate, right, you might have a higher chance of getting chronic kidney disease, which could become kidney failure. Um, Unfortunately, there is a risk that you might need a kidney in the future if you do develop kidney um, disease. However, national policy from the United Network for Organ Sharing gives living donors a priority on the national wait list 
So if you are a living donor and you end up do needing a kidney, you are prioritized over other people for receiving that organ. Um, some of these things might happen during surgery um, or after surgery, and they could be short-term or they, should, they could be permanent. It, it varies and we're, un, we're unsure um, if it would be permanent. But you could have kidney failure and need dialysis. You will lose some of your kidney function. And if you do become pregnant after donating, you are likely to have high, um, more likely to have high blood pressure during your pregnancy in the future, which is something we call preeclampsia. So it's just pretty important that if you are a donor and you feel like you're going to have children in the future, that you talk about this with your doctor and they might put some extra precautions in place for your pregnancy to make sure that they can monitor you appropriately. That's probably what a doctor would tell you. So the next stage after you get through all of that and we tell you all the things that could happen to you and you say, I still want to do it anyways, which is what most people will do, <laughs> you move on to having surgery, okay? Most donor surgery is laparoscopic and it's called a laparoscopic donor nephrectomy. I don't really know a surgeon who's gonna tell you that it could not have the possibility of converting to an open procedure, which means that they make a bigger incision than they would with the laparoscopic you know, surgical instruments. That's, that is something that may happen, so people will tell you that. But most donor nephrectomies in the United States are laparoscopic. Surgery can usually be scheduled in four to six weeks in advance. It totally depends on the transplant program, it totally depends on the donor, and it totally depends on the recipient. Sometimes the donor might be cleared to donate six months before they actually end up donating because they had some other life event that they needed to work out. They needed to finish school. They needed to do a job thing. I think transplant centers are flexible, which is one of the benefits of living donation as a planned surgery. Um, the donor nephrectomy surgery takes between two and three hours. It can take longer. Um, and donors usually spend two to three days in the hospital, could be less, could be more, usually two days. I, I really don't know many donors that kick, get um, leaving the hospital the first day um, after donation. We usually wanna make sure that you're up and moving around and feeling good before they let you out. So after you donate, you might have something called a patient controlled anesthesia device. It's a little pump that you push in your hand. And then you might switch to oral medication to control your pain after surgery. I will say that getting up and around will help you recover faster. Listen to your nurses. This is actually a picture of me and my cousin who I donated my kidney to in 2009. It was about eight years ago, actually. And getting up and around was one of the best things that nurses told me to do. And it was hard when I was in that position, but it definitely made it better. Your recovery can actually take between two and 12 weeks and it is absolutely individual. And I always tell donors that you need to take it easy on yourself and don't push too hard, okay? You don't wanna be lifting any more than 10 pounds for six weeks after donation to prevent hernia. This does happen to people. People think they can be Wonder Woman, Superman and go ahead and do all things and then they end up having a complication that we have to surgically correct. That is not a good thing. Um, so most doctors will say not to drive for two weeks after donation. That is also variable. I think that has a lot to do with what type of pain medication you might be on after your surgery and how quickly you're able to not be on that anymore. Um, you might need to have some help with child care, particularly if you have young children, because you can't pick them up and carry them around, and they'll need to be sensitive to that. Um, and depending on what type of job you do, I work at a, uh, my brain and my computer are really where I do most of my work. Um, I don't do manual labor, but if you do um, work in a job like construction or something, you might need eight weeks off from work. And that is something that you would need to talk about with your doctor very carefully. And hopefully there's opportunities um, for that once you move to this process. And Finally, I'll talk about the last stage of donation, which is long-term follow-up. Right now, after you donate a kidney in the United States, the transplant hospital that you donate at is required by the United Network for Organ Sharing to keep in touch with you after donation for two years. They're gonna contact you at six months, they're gonna contact you at one year, and they're gonna contact you two years after you donate. And they wanna make sure that your kidney function is doing good and that you're still, um, you're still trucking along. However, we have some international guidelines 
um, the Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcomes. It's a group called KDGO, and they are the world leaders with international experts from the United States um, who focused on developing guidelines. And we recommend that there are annual post-donation follow-up care for every donor. This isn't really different necessarily than everybody that needs to go to the doctor for a checkup every year anyways. So it's not something totally out of um, ordinary, but it's very important that people that donate a kidney watch their blood pressure and have their blood pressure checked regularly to make sure they do not develop hypertension. It's important to kind of keep your weight under control and make sure that your body mass index or the percentage of body fat um, to lean mass ratio that you have is, is acceptable within normal ranges and doesn't get out of control. Um, we want to check your serum creatinine, and everybody that's a kidney patient probably knows what serum creatinine is, but it's basically we want to estimate your kidney function, and all you need for that is a simple blood test and to measure your protein in your urine to make sure you're not having that. We'll check you with like an easy urine, urine test. So the testing after donation annually is not that complicated, but it's very important, and I cannot stress it enough. Um, I mentioned this already, that the U.S. transplant hospitals must follow you up, uh, follow up with you after donation for one, uh, six months, one year, and two years. But the advice that we all have for you um, in the transplant community, who people that work with donors every day, we tell you regu uh, regularly exercise, get out there, stay healthy, have a healthy and balanced diet, don't smoke, and support your own psychosocial well-being. So we just want to make sure that you stay healthy after donation. It's incredibly important, not only for you, but your recipient as well. Um, I know at least my cousin who has my kidney for eight years now is always making sure that I'm still doing okay, and that's important for everybody. So if you want to learn more about living donation, there are two, uh, I'm sorry, three websites I've provided here. One is the United Network for Organ Sharing, which provides all information you could need to know about the transplant system, as well as information about living donation. Um, at Johns Hopkins, we have developed a new website that we're looking at, seeing if it helps with our patients in, with informed consent for donation. It's called livingdonorfacts.org. You're welcome to check that out. And the National Kidney Foundation also has a great page on living donation. And as, um, as mentioned earlier, in my bio, we are about to launch a brand new Facebook health app called Kidney Space. Kidney Space will be available pretty soon, and I will tell the American Kidney uh, Fund when it's available, and maybe they'll be able to share with their networks. But it will have all of this information and link out to other trusted resources. So it's um, something you can access on Facebook and participate in a community of other transplant patients, recipients, um, and living donors. And it's also a place where caregivers will be able to um, have a safe space to communicate about donation and transplant. Great. Well, thank you uh, to both Dr. Henderson and Steve and Heather for joining us today. At this time, i uh, ask each of you uh, to answer a few questions we've, we've received over the course of the webinar. But before we jump into that, um, I know, Steve, you are very, very uh, active on Twitter. I follow you on Twitter. Uh, do, and uh, Dr. Henderson, I'll offer this to you as well, if you want to share your Twitter handle so folks can kind of follow you uh, and interact with you that way. Steve? Yeah, um, on Twitter, you can find me um, at Steve underscore Winfrey, W-I-N-F-R-E-E. -E. Great. And Dr. Henderson? On Twitter, you can find me at Macy, M-A-C-E-Y L Henderson at Macy, M-A-C-E-Y-L Henderson, H-E-N-D-E-R-S-O-N. Thank you both. So Steve, first question for you. Uh, you had mentioned uh, that you were first diagnosed at age 18. I have a question asking, how has your perspective about having chronic kidney disease changed from when you were first diagnosed? That's a great question. Um, when I first was diagnosed, I'd mentioned um, when I was answering some of the questions that I was very young, um, I was very naive, and I didn't handle it very well. Um, I let my disease kind of control me more than than not. Uh, but as I've gotten older and a little bit wiser and a little more knowledgeable on the disease, my perspective is, you know what? It, it, it's a, a nasty little disease. I'd rather not have it, but you know what? Um, it is part of my life. Uh, it is something that I have to deal with, but you know what? Um, chronic kidney disease 
is not a death sentence. Um, while you do have to change some of the things that you do in life in regards to your nutrition and things like that, at the end of the day, um, I, you know, I've just learned to accept it and make it just part of my day, um, not control my day. Thank you. So, Dr. Henderson, this next one's for you, and a question regarding uh, you being a living donor. Uh, was your was your family supportive of your decision to do that? Um, absolutely. I will tell you, though, that I was a young living donor. I donated at 24, and as I told you, a lot of things were um, unknown about what my future risk for kidney disease might be. So, as any mother might be. My mom was a little concerned and worried, and I won't lie about that. That's the truth. My family was 100% supportive of me making this decision, and my dad asked me one question. He said, why are you doing this? And I said, because I'm not scared, and I'm doing this out of love and not fear. And he said, as long as you're not scared and this is out of love, then I'm supportive of you. That's my, my take on this. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Steve, next one for you. Um, you know, you talked about the need to kind of connect with other patients and how you're always willing to do that. Um, where do you go for support online uh, for, for finding help and talking to other people? The, the question is specifically for young people uh, or children with CKD, but um, I know just in general, it's really lacking out there, but just curious about where you go to find uh, support. Yeah, um, I, I do agree that especially for uh, younger people who do have the disease, sometimes it can be a little harder to find um, groups of people to try to get involved with. But I'll tell you, um, I found that when I, when I first started getting into the idea of wanting to reach out to other kidney patients, I really just started doing it on Facebook. I was Googling um, different kidney support groups. I started doing that. Um, Twitter has actually been a very, very powerful and strong resource for me because Social media is actually how I got involved with the American Kidney Fund. Um, if you're following the right people like the American Kidney Fund and Donate Life America, um, they put plenty of resources out there that will connect you. Doing webinars like this for the folks that came on and uh, wanted to learn more about it and become more educated, that's another way that you can uh, connect with people. So if you can use social media for the good, you know, and, and that instant access to, uh, to resources, they're out there. You just you just have to dig a little bit. Um, but I would definitely say um, American Kidney Fund themselves, Twitter and Facebook are, are excellent starting points. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Dr. Henderson, question for you. What's the maximum age that a person can still be a living kidney donor? Okay. This is very dependent on the surgeon. We are not giving maximum ages. I know, I believe one of our top transplant surgeons at Johns Hopkins has done a kidney donor on someone in the 70s. Wow. It's very dependent on the individual and, and on the transplant program. I don't, we, we're, I'm not comfortable saying it's a maximum age limit, but you have to be 18 at minimum to do it. Okay. All right. Uh, for both Steve and Heather, in general, you've both had to make adjustments in your everyday life. What are some key things you both are having to do or plan for in preparation for your transplant? Um, yeah, that's a great question. So, some of the things that we have had to talk about and coordinate, um, Steve and I are both foster parents, so we had to coordinate with our social workers um, and other family to um, care for um, our children while we are in recovery because like um, Dr. Henderson said, um, you know, there's weightlifting restrictions. Our foster children are Two and a half years old and six months old and so they're both they're both over 10 pounds and you know they require being lifted um, quite often so finding child care that um, will take care of our kids um, you have to figure out the finances um, both of us will be out of work um, for recovery so figuring that out is part of it um, and then also something um, that you need to have in place is a good support system um, during recovery. You have to have support people that will be there at the hospital when you wake up to help you out. Um, you know, the nurses and doctors are there, but you're going to want somebody there that is a familiar face that's really going to be advocating for you um, during your recovery as well. 
Um, for me, I would say, to put it bluntly, is we're doing everything we can to take care of ourselves to not screw it up. Um, and what I mean is we are making sure I'm taking my medicine, taking care of my sugars, um, watching what we eat, um, trying to limit our stress, uh, to try to keep a focus on the, the surgery and trying to uh, keep that the main thing. And, uh, and going back to the, to the finance thing, um, our, at Vanderbilt, they talked about, you know, if you're somebody that's going to either be a donor or you're receiving, you're going to have to miss work. You know, Dr. Henderson talked about that. And a good idea is to, to fundraise. Um, I know sometimes that's uncomfortable, but sometimes you have to kind of do what you have to do to, to get by. So even Heather and I created a GoFundMe page um, just to raise some money to help us out that month that we're both going to be out. And with some of the medication costs and some of the surgery costs and the hotel costs. Um, so that's a few other planning things we've had to do. Thank you guys. So we have time for just one more question for Dr. Henderson. Uh, can a parent donate to their child? And if so, how often does that happen? Absolutely. Parents donate to their children every day. In fact, I believe that is, I don't have the math in front of me, but the, the numbers, that is probably one of the most common um, types of living directed donation is an adult recipient to a pediatric patient. Um, I am not 100% positive, but I do believe that a child needs to be at least two years old to receive a kidney transplant um, from a living donor. Um, that's sort of what I, my experience has been. Now that is probably very dependent on surgeons and center and size, but you have to think about a, a, the size of an adult size kidney for a child. Well, thanks to all three of you again very much. Thanks to those who joined us and sent in some really great questions uh, this week. We appreciate it. Um, again, if you're a healthcare professional, please share this webinar with your patients and their families. And if you'd like to receive a certificate of attendance, you can email us at education at kidneyfund.org. Our next webinar will be held on Tuesday, September the 19th from 2 to 3 p.m. Eastern. Dr. Elaine Koo will join us to discuss the important connection between hepatitis C and kidney disease. Hepatitis C is more common in people with kidney disease, and many people don't know they have it. It is important to learn your risk and to be tested. Registration is now open. Visit kidneyfund.org slash webinars for more information and to register. When the webinar closes, please do not close your browser window. You may see a pop-up saying that the webinar has ended. Please close that pop-up and proceed to the webinar evaluation survey. Your honest feedback will help us make our webinar program the best it can be. Thanks, everyone, for joining us, and we'll see you again next month.